Presented by Caltech. Uh, good evening. Uh, as you heard, my name is Steve Mayo. I'm the chair of the Division of Biology and Biological Engineering here at Caltech. And it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Parker as tonight's Watson lecturer. Joe is an assistant professor of biology and biological engineering and has been on the faculty at Caltech for just over two years. He earned a BSc degree in zoology with first class honors from Imperial College London, completed his PhD at the University of Cambridge MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, and did postdoctoral work at Columbia University while also studying invertebrate zoology as a research associate at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Joe received both a Rita Allen Foundation Scholar Award and a Klingenstein Simons Fellowship Award in Neuroscience last year in 2018. And despite the relatively short time that Joe has been on the faculty here, he's credited with co-founding Caltech's new Center for Evolutionary Science. Prior to joining Caltech, Joe's day job was in the area of developmental biology utilizing the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster as a model system. His work in this area using a classical model organism was exceptional. However, Joe's real passion and current research emphasis is in the area of convergent evolution, particularly as it relates to the evolution of symbiotic interactions between beetles and ants, which we'll hear much more about in his talk. Joe's interest in bugs is not new. As a child growing up in England, Joe was fascinated with these tiny creatures from a very early age and spent countless hours pursuing his curiosity in the Welsh countryside near his home. As a parent, I can imagine how this probably went. <laughs> Seven-year-old Joe, probably dressed up like Indiana Jones, decides to start a new collection. But rather than amassing a collection of expired insects, Joe is happy to entertain his family with new house guests that constantly turn up in the most interesting places, probably including dropping on your neck from the ceiling while eating dinner. For some reason, when I think about this, I can't uh, get the image out of my mind of a pet cat sharing its half-eaten but still alive prey with the family. It's from this early beginning that Joe comes to us tonight. The title of Joe's talk is How to Deceive Society, an Insect Masterclass. Please join me in welcoming Professor Parker to the podium. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. It's great to see everybody. Thank you, Steve, for that introduction. Uh, and I have to thank the organizers for making this event happen, too. Um, what I want to talk to you about this evening is the phenomenon of being persuaded to act against your own best interests. Now, throughout human history, you've seen examples of groups of people or nations being manipulated through outright deception. And you may assume from these cases, there's many of them, that humans are particularly prone to this unfortunate condition. But what I want to share with you tonight is really the fact that manipulation and deceit are not anything specific to humans. They're not new phenomena. They're really widespread in the natural world, in particular in insects. Okay, they're really effective strategies for getting what you want, and they've evolved many times. And I want you to leave this talk with an appreciation that by studying this basic phenomenon, it sheds light on a much more general principle of the natural world, which is how organisms have evolved to interact with each other. Now, I put this picture up here of these ants, and it's been up here a while. Some of you may have noticed that some of these ants look a little bit different to the other ants in this picture. So for example, this ant here, its abdomen is uh, slightly yellowish. Its anterior body is a slightly different shape. That's because this ant here isn't an ant at all. It's actually a beetle that lives amongst these ants and is accepted by them as a nest mate, right? Which sounds really harmonious, except for the fact that this beetle has tricked these ants into accepting it and feeds on their eggs and larvae as a fiendishly deceptive colony parasite. And what I want to share with you today is the work in my laboratory on this specific group of beetles and how it sheds light on a really pervasive feature of the animal kingdom, which is the evolution of social behavior. 
Now, across the animal tree of life, you see the repeated evolution of highly complex and elaborate forms of social behavior. This is really kind of testament to the a basic property of the animal brain, which is the ability to recognize other individuals and execute behavioral programs that foster interactions between those individuals. And we tend to think about social behavior as existing within species. So for example, humans interact with each other, so do ants, so do deer. But one of the most pronounced manifestations <coughs> of social behavior is seen in species that have evolved to interact in the context of symbiosis. So symbiotic interactions across species boundaries are really rampant in the animal kingdom, and they kind of underscore the evolvability of animals to engage in interactions that break through the species barrier and often enable organisms to start speaking each other's language. So it's a wonderful system to understand how social behavior evolves. Okay, and it's particularly interesting because as organisms evolve symbioses and become dependent on other organisms, it's not just their behavior that evolves, it's really every dimension of their biology. So their physiology, their ecology, their reproductive biology, and often their anatomy too, all evolve in concert as they s depart an ancestral free living existence and become symbiotic organisms that are dependent on other species. Now, I want to stress right at the beginning of the talk that when I use the word symbiosis, this is an umbrella definition that includes anything from mutualism, like these cleaner fish here, where both partners in the symbiosis benefit, to parasitism here, where only one partner in the interaction benefits. So symbiosis just means organisms living together. And of course, humans are prone to symbiotic interactions too. If you think about all the animals that we uh, domesticated or keep captive, these are really our symbionts. Really what a dog is, is a symbiotic wolf that lives with a human host organism, okay? And it's debatable whether this is a really mutualistic or parasitic association, probably depends on how well trained your dog is, okay? So this is the phenomenon that we're really interested in in my lab, is the evolution of behavioral symbioses between different animal species. And the group of organisms that we used to study this phenomenon in are the beetles. Now, I spent most of my uh, budget for this talk on Shutterstock images of beetles. So I'm gonna leave this slide up here for a while. So you can just marvel at the amazing beauty of the Coleoptera, the beetles. There's 400,000 described species of beetles. That's the largest group of organisms on Earth. And probably the key to beetle success is their innovative morphology. The chief kind of innovation that beetles have is, the, is, the, uh, is this structure here, the elytron. This is a transformed forewing. Uh, into a, uh, the forewings become this kind of shield-like structure that protects the delicate flight wings, okay? So beetles can fly, but their wings are physically protected. And this has enabled beetles to infiltrate many different niches in terrestrial ecosystems that are shut off to most other insects that have delicate membranous flight wings. And so beetles can access many different aspects of the uh, of habitats, but they can still fly and disperse and speciate. And that's probably why there's 400,000 different species of beetles. Now, one thing you probably don't know about beetles is that the largest group of beetles, the largest family, and there's 177 different beetle families, are a quite obscure group called the rove beetles, okay? The 64,000 species of rove beetles, this is about the same size as all of the vertebrates put together. So it's this huge radiation of these beetles. And rove beetles don't look like your typical beetles. They've got these short elytra, okay, as opposed to long elytra that cover and physically protect the abdomen. These short elytra leave the abdominal segments exposed in rove beetles, and that's their key feature. And the abdomen is flexible and the segments kind of telescope together and that enables rove beetles to snake through leaf litter and soil habitats chasing down other species of arthropod. So within the coleoptera, within the beetles, there's just been this secondary modification of the body plan and this huge proliferation of these beetles in soil and litter habitats uh, 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 live a kind of predatory existence, okay? So the bulk of these things are carnivorous. But rove beetles are not just fascinating because of their exceptional diversity. And I should add that this 64,000 species is maybe five to 10% of the total number of species out there. Most rove beetles remain to be uh, discovered and described. Um, but 
to me, the most fascinating thing about rogue beetles is that repeatedly during their evolution, they gained the capacity to do something amazing. Um, I should also add that this is a particularly gaudy rogue beetle. Most of them look like these tiny little brown things down here, just a few millimeters long. It's no wonder nobody knows anything about them. Um, but although kind of mundane and insignificant, they've gained the capacity to do something really remarkable during their evolution. Whereas most beetles like this one here, or most insects that would wander into an ant colony would be recognized as an intruder and attacked instantly, ants have cuticular pheromones, these body surface pheromones, hydrocarbon compounds that they use to recognize members of their own colony. And insects like this one here that would walk into a colony and don't match that specific cuticular hydrocarbon code are recognized as intruders and ants are innately programmed to attack them. And that's what's happening to this beetle here. So the majority of organisms, ant colonies are really shut off, like it, it, un, impenetrable fortresses. But rove beetles repeatedly during evolution have gained the capacity to kind of hijack or bypass these nest mate recognition systems and infiltrate ant colonies, often spectacularly so. So look at this rove beetle here. Rather than being attacked by this ant, it's being fed trophallactically, mouth to mouth by it. So the ant's regurgitating liquid food to this beetle, and it's treating this beetle as if it were actually a nest mate. It's gained acceptance inside the colony. Okay, and this beetle is so specialized for life inside ant societies. If you take it out of the colony, it can't feed itself. It's dead within a few days. Um, its entire head has evolved into something which is essentially a kind of straw for being fed liquid food by the ants. Um, how can the beetles do this? Well, if you look at this ant here, it's licking this part of the beetle's body, right? And that corresponds to this kind of brush-like structures here. There's one either side of the body. These brushes are kind of like biological candle wicks which conduct compounds from big glands at the base of the abdomen here. And what these compounds are, are kind of mind control substances that pacify the aggressive ants and cause the ant to adopt the beetle inside the nest. So this is kind of chemical manipulation that this beetle has evolved to infiltrate the colony. And this part of the body, like ants are so obsessed with it that it's evolved into a kind of notch that perfectly fits the ant's mandibles, its mouth parts. And they can pick the beetle up by this part of the body and carry it around the, the nest and then deposit it in the brood galleries. And once it's in there, even though its mouth is this kind of straw thing, it's still got rudimentary mandibles and it'll pierce open the ant eggs and suck out the insides. This is an amazing strategy for infiltrating um, ant colonies. Now, <coughs> uh, organisms that can do this, that live inside ant societies, are called myrmecophiles, right? Ant lovers, which is an extremely satisfying word to say, okay? So on the count of three, I want everybody to say myrmecophiles, okay? <laughs> After three, one, okay, one, two, three. Okay, that, that, it's a good feeling, isn't it, when you say that? <laughs> uh, so myrmecophiles, right? Like, and the way of life is called myrmecophily, ant loving. And if you look across the evolutionary tree of insects, you can see myrmecophily evolving really kind of sporadically, kind of scattershot manner. So there are species of crickets like this one here, which are integrated inside ant societies and accepted by ants. Um, then there's an entire family of butterflies, the Lycenidae, the blue butterflies, which have caterpillars, many of which are socially integrated inside ant colonies. And myrmecophily is really an amazing phenomenon in which to study the evolution of social and symbiotic behaviors, because every time it evolves, it's a real manifestation of really complex and intimate interactions that are occurring across species boundaries. Now, across the insect tree of life, by far the largest number of independent evolutionary origins of myrmecophily are found within the beetles. And often, when beetles evolve myrmecophily, they're subject to really different selection pressures to their ancestors that lived outside of ant colonies. And this is reflected in really dramatic changes in their anatomy. It's kind of evolution in the extreme. And I'm gonna show you a kind of demonstration of this by comparing some myrmecophile beetles to their free living close relatives that kind of represent the ancestral condition from which those myrmecophiles evolved. So just to get started, this beetle here uh, is a ground beetle, a free-living genus called Harpalus. It's very common 
free-living predatory beetle, okay? Quite boring-looking beetle. Now, this is a kind of version of Harpalus, the ground beetle, which has evolved to live inside ant colonies and obligately associated with ants, okay? It's a true myrmecophile. And you can see it's got these kind of Mickey Mouse ears up here. And what those Mickey Mouse ears are are actually the beetle's antennae, right? But all of the segments are fused together and expanded into this huge disc-like structure and the disc is decorated with glandular units that are secreting these appeasement compounds, okay? So this beetle will wander up to ants, ants will like investigate it, and start licking the, uh, the Mickey Mouse antenna of this beetle, and it'll cause the uh, uh, ants to adopt this beetle into the colony. And again, it's a kind of Trojan horse-esque phenomenon, because once inside, it'll start preying on the ant's brood. Okay, so it's this chemical strategy to infiltrate the, the nest. Um, here's another example comparing myrmecophiles to free-living beetles. Uh, this is a rove beetle, very much like the ones I showed you uh, earlier on in the talk, a free-living generalist uh, uh, predator. And this is a rove beetle that's evolved to live inside colonies of afrotropical driver ants, which are extremely aggressive ants that form massive colonies. Okay, and what has happened to this beetle is it's really transformed its dorsal body into a shield. Okay, and the shield's decorated with kind of spines. And this beetle's actually under permanent attack from the ants in the colony, but it can handle it because its body is this kind of heavily armored structure. All of its legs and antennae and head are kind of hidden from a dorsal view. It's evolutionarily lost its elytra and wings, and its whole structure has turned into essentially a shield. And so this beetle and the previous beetle kind of <coughs> represent the two different strategies for making a living inside ant colonies. You can invest in kind of chemical and behavioral adaptations to gain your host's acceptance and assimilate into the social fabric of the nest, or you can just toughen up and modify your body to be physically well protected and just withstand all of the attacks from your aggressive host organisms. Now, it's within the rove beetles in particular that Myrmecophily goes insane, and you get tons and tons of independent evolutionary origins of Myrmecophily, and I'm gonna talk about why that is a little bit later, but I wanna show you one of the most extreme manifestations of Myrmecophily and rove beetles, and that's seen in species which have evolved to live inside colonies of army ants, right? Now, if you don't know what army ants are, army ants are really the dominant predators of tropical ecosystems. They're these huge colonies of millions of workers that lack permanent nest sites and emigrate across the tropical forest floor, feeding on other arthropods. They're kind of the poster child of tropical biology, and they're extremely aggressive, nasty ants. Um, and if you encounter one of their emigration or raiding trails as you're walking through the tropical forest, you may see that maybe one in every 500 to 1,000 ants or something like this is actually a rove beetle that looks like this, right? It has a so-called myrmecoid or ant-mimicking body plan. And it's not just mimicking the ants, it's actually socially integrated into their nest. So these, ant, these beetles are accepted by the ants, and we think the mimicry is serves this kind of purpose of tactile integration inside the colony. We think army ants use a lot of touch kind of cues to recognize nest mates as well as chemical cues. And this is selected for this transformation in the shape of the beetle body into something much more ant-like. Um, and there are several dozen genera of these really remarkable myrmecoid rove beetles uh, that live with different um, army ants in different tropical regions of the world. So, it's a kind of example of extreme symbiotic evolution, whereby ancestral beetles like the, these guys here have transformed into these things that look and kind of behave like ants, but are these freeloading social parasites in their colonies. Okay, now there's been a sort of controversy in the field among the sort of 10 of us who care about this kind of thing <laughs> about, how many times a beetle like this has evolved into a beetle like this? It's such a ridiculous sort of evolutionary scenario. It can't possibly have happened more than once, okay? And that's kind of historically how this phenomenon has been treated. It's the single origin of this way of life in rove beetles, and these beetles have kind of co-radiated with army ants as army ants have diversified in different tropical uh, ecosystems. But we weren't really satisfied with this because the evolutionary relationships of these different myrmecoid rove beetles were not known. And so together with Munatoshi Maruyama, who's a rove beetle taxonomist, 
So he goes out to the tropical regions mainly and finds new rove beetle species and gives them names. We collected these myrmecoid rove beetles from different tropical uh, rainforest ecosystems to resolve their evolutionary relationships using DNA sequence data. So to see really the true picture of their evolution, whether it evolved once or in fact multiple times. And this is the uh, evolutionary tree, the phylogeny that we produced from doing this analysis. And what you can see is that it's evolved many, many times over in rogue beetles. So to kind of walk you through this tree, you can see all of these black lineages here they are these free-living rove beetles that have this kind of typical rove beetle morphology, and they all descend from some common ancestor back here, which has undergone all this kind of diversification. Okay, but you can see sometimes these lineages turn orange, right? And each one of these orange lineages is one of these extremely dramatic myrmecoid symbiotic species that lives with army ants. And all of these guys are not related to each other. They're cropping up over and over again in a really scattered pattern over a dozen times independently from this beetle family, okay? So this is a really amazing example of convergent evolution. If you think about, you know, things like um, flapping wings in birds, bats, pterosaurs, and um, insects, these are traits which we refer to as convergent traits. It's organisms evolving the same solution to the same biological problem. In this case, taking to the air and evolving a flapping wing in each independent case. But what's really dramatic here is that you have this entire symbiotic phenomenon appearing over and over again. It's a convergent system of symbiosis, which is kind of unique. Each one of these independent evolutionary origins of these myrmecoid rove beetles is associated with a single genus of army ant, okay? They're extremely host-specific. And what you can tell from this pattern is that every time a beetle like this has evolved to ecologically associate with a species of army ant, its morphology and aspects of its behavior have walked down a really predictable evolutionary trajectory to produce something unique in the animal kingdom, which is a convergent system of social and symbiotic evolution, and potentially a very powerful group of organisms to study how complex social and symbiotic lifestyles evolve. Now, I'm just gonna give you, kind of emphasize how strikingly convergent these beetles can be uh, by showing you a couple of examples. This is a, a, one of these myrmecoid rove beetles that lives in South America, uh, associated with this species of army ant. This is a beetle that's independently evolved in Southeast Asian tropical rainforest to live with a different species of army ant. Now look how similar those beetles are, right? They both evolved from ancestral beetles that looked like this, but they did so independently and they converged on the same kind of morphology and. Uh, uh, morphological solution. It's really strikingly predictable evolutionary change. Well, what I wanna stress at this point is that it, even though the kind of morphology is so striking, the behavioral convergence is also really extreme. So if you take any of these examples of these beetles from across the tree, wherever you see them evolving the symbiosis with army ants and study their behavior inside the colonies, this is the kind of thing you'll see. You'll see the beetle is essentially accepted perfectly into the nest. It's perfectly adjusted to life among the ants. This beetle here is being groomed by the ants, like the ants giving its antennae a good old lick. Uh, and the beetle is completely fine with it. These are extremely hostile, horrible ants to work with, but the beetle is perfectly at home inside the colony. And actually, if you take the beetle away from these ants, Nobody knows how to culture them. They're dead within a couple of days. They can only survive inside the context of these hostile army ant societies. And just to underscore how sort of ridiculous this is that the beetles have been able to do this and do it so many times so effectively, this is what happens when I try and socially integrate into a colony <laughs> of army ants. This is my gardening glove after putting in the, into a, an army ant bivouac inside a hole in a tree for just a few seconds. Um, they really do not like anything uh, um, uh, me messing with them. So, in rove beetles, you get this evolution of this really complex symbiotic phenomenon from this ancestral free living existence. And it hasn't just happened once, it's happened many, many times over. And it's not just army ants that these beetles have infiltrated, it's other kinds of ants too. So if you're interested in this phenomenon of social or symbiotic evolution, which you see across the animal tree of life, 
you can really do no better than study these beetles, because at a drop of a hat, they're sort of predisposed to make this transition from a free-living solitary existence to this remarkable social symbiosis inside ant colonies. Now, it's not just ant colonies which have succumbed to infiltration by rove beetles, it's termites too, which is the other great social group of insects. Now, social, uh, termites look a little bit different to ants. This is, people don't know what termites look like. Most of you probably do, because your house is currently being eaten by them in Southern California. Uh, this is what termites look like. They look a little bit different to ants. And sure enough, when rove beetles evolve to infiltrate termite societies, they start to look like termites. So this, believe it or not, is a symbiotic termitophile rove beetle, which is found only inside termite colonies. This is the, the beetle here, and this is the termite here, uh, its host. And we think this kind of morphology is also involved in mimicking tactile touch cues inside the termite society. So we think as well as chemistry in these beetles, like the shape of the organism also matters for nest mate recognition. So to assimilate and gain acceptance inside the termite nest, you have to start to look like this. And what's sort of ridiculous about this, this beetle here is it hatches out of the pupil case, looking not too dissimilar to this one here, right? But it starts feeding and growing and turning into this kind of grotesque, obese morphology, which enables it to trick termites into believing it is a termite. And we now know that this kind of grotesque, obese adaptation has also evolved multiple times in rove beetles. So these are four independent evolutionary origins of this termitophily that we see in rove beetles. You can see here social integration with the beetle being fed mouth to mouth by the ant worker. So clearly these beetles are amazingly good at gaining access and you know, living symbiotically inside colonies of social insects. So we wondered, kind of how far back in ant and termite evolution could we find evidence of this uh, taking place? Now, the oldest ants and termites that show any evidence of eusociality, complex social behavior and colony formation, occur in 99 million year old Burmese amber, right? Slap bang in the middle of the Cretaceous, dinosaurs are walking around, and you suddenly see the first ant societies. And you can tell that they were social because they show, even encapsulated in amber, elements of caste differentiation, so there were queens and workers, and you can also find foraging trails and intercolony aggression and all these other amazing hallmarks of social, uh, uh, social insects. Um, sure enough, after looking through a ton of Burmese amber, we found this which is the earliest known animal symbion and lived inside colonies of these early social insects. We call it mesosymbion, the Mesozoic symbion, and it bears all of the hallmarks of the kind of defensive, uh, defensive modifications for infiltrating either colonies of ants or termites. So its thorax has evolved into this kind of hood that protects the triangular-shaped head. The head faces backwards, which is super unusual for free-living species, but quite typical for um, uh, symbiotic species, and all of its antennae and appendages have been kind of strengthened and modified. Uh, and again, this is a hallmark of symbiotic species. And the beetle itself belongs to a modern group. It's an ancient member of a modern group, which are found inside ant and termite society. So this combination of its kind of evolutionary position within this group and its morphological adaptations show that right at the dawn of ant and termite social behavior, these beetles have already turned up to the party and were exploiting this new niche as a kind of open resource to, for, uh, 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 for them to, to, to make use of. Now, you can kind of put a time frame on the evolution of these beetles with respect to the diversification of ants. Okay, now we kind of take it for granted that ants are this dominant social species which are kind of prevalent in all terrestrial ecosystems, um, but it, that's a, this is evolution, in evolution, evolutionary terms quite a recent phenomenon. It's only probably within the past 50 years or so that ants have really taken off as a kind of global life force in this regard. Um, this graph here shows the percent of insects that are ants in different fossil deposits from the time of Burmese amber production 99 million years ago to the most recent amber deposit, Dominican amber, um, 20 to uh, 30 million years ago. Now, what you can see is that during the Cretaceous, including in Burmese amber, ants are far less than 1% of the total number of insects 
in this fossil deposit. And this means that they were probably ecologically quite insignificant compared to other groups of insects, right? It's only about 50 million years ago that you start to see ant abundance increase. Okay, so by the time of sort of Baltic amber, 45 million years ago, ants are now between eight and 10% of the total number of insect species. And by the time you get to Dominican amber, you know, 20 to 25 million years ago, ants are now 40% uh, of the total number of insects. And of course, ants in present day ecosystems can be 25% of total animal biomass. Okay, so there's been this expansion, this proliferation of ants in terrestrial ecosystems over the past 50 million years or so. So when I go collecting uh, beetles from leaf litter in tropical forest ecosystems, which is the kind of thing I like to do, uh, this is my tray here and my gardening glove and I sift little piece, pieces of litter looking for beetles, really 95% of what I get out is ants, okay? They cloak the entire forest floor, okay? And you have to imagine that as ants evolve to be this kind of dominant social insect life force, it must have radically changed ecosystems. It probably drove a lot of insect groups to extinction and selected for organisms that could coexist with the ants. And one of the groups of organisms that could do this are probably the rove beetles. And this is why there's so many species of rove beetles, because ants kind of paved the way for them to start diversifying in tropical forest floors in particular. Now, you can see this evolutionarily if you date the evolutionary tree of rove beetles. So this is the uh, same evolutionary tree I showed you earlier. And you can see rove beetles are a much more ancient group than probably ants are. They go back probably to the kind of late Jurassic or at least the base of the Cretaceous 150 uh, uh, million years ago. Um, and they started diver diversifying. And then suddenly ants take off in this window here, and you see all of these lineages jump ship and start taking up residence inside ant colonies. These are just the species which have evolved to live inside army ant colonies, but there are probably hundreds of other evolutionary transitions to life inside other kinds of ants, colonies of other kinds of ants, okay? So really this rise of the ants has provided a resource for the convergent evolution of Myrmecophily in these rove beetles. Now, you're probably wondering, you know, what is special about these rove beetles? Clearly, you know, this is a phenomenon specific to rove beetles. There are, like I said at the beginning of my talk, 400,000 described species of beetles, and it's only within the rove beetles in particular, which are just 15% of the order Coleoptera, that you get this kind of predisposition to social insect symbiosis. Now, the reason I think rove beetles are special goes back to their unique morphology in the context of the coleoptera. Remember I said they had these short elytra, these wing cases, that leave the abdomen exposed, right? And this is great because it enabled the beetle to kind of flex through uh, uh, leaf litter habitats and move really rapidly through the soil, feeding on other arthropods. But it left the abdomen physically exposed. And this was a kind of Achilles heel for rove beetles. And what's happened is multiple lineages of rove beetles have responded to that weakness by investing instead in chemical defense mechanisms. So this rove beetle here, at the tip of its abdomen back here, if you break open this segment, you'll see this invagination of the cells to produce this kind of bag, which is a chemical reservoir containing this yellow stuff, which is benzoquinone. Benzoquinone is a really nasty compound. It's a topical irritant that enables these beetles to chemically defend themselves extremely well in aggressive interactions with other organisms, including ants. So I'll show you a video of what rove beetles do when they encounter ants. This is a free living rove beetle that we work with in the lab. Ants will approach it aggressively, but it just loops its abdomen around, blasts the ant in the face with benzoquinones and goes about its day, okay? So it's very, very good at deterring ants and keeping them at bay. Okay, and presumably this is one of the features of these beetles that has enabled them to coexist with ants in terrestrial ecosystems, proliferate and diversify so massively um, in amongst the ants. And it's secondarily given them access to ant colonies because they can wander in if they want to, chemically defending themselves and feeding on the resources inside ant nests. So things like the brood and the raided food items are extremely attractive to predatory organisms like rove beetles.
And I think this explains the repeated evolution of myrmecophily and rove beetles from this kind of facultative capacity to break an end to ant colonies, chemically defending yourself. Many independent lineages have specialized on ant colonies as a resource and evolved into myrmecophiles. And this is why you get this convergent system of social and symbiotic evolution in rove beetles specifically, but not other groups of insects. Now, when rove beetles specialize on ant colonies and start to evolve into myrmecophiles, their abdominal glandular chemistry becomes a, a real target for natural selection to modify the compounds that these beetles produce to be able to manipulate ants better to maintain a permanent presence inside ant colonies. So I'll give you an example of this. This beetle here, Lomacusa, um, it's kind of like a myrmecophile version of the beetle I showed you in the previous slide. Ants will approach Lomacusa aggressively. They'll approach it, it'll loop its flexible abdomen round, just like the free living species do when they deploy benzoquinones. But in the case of Lomacusa, look what's happening here. It's actually secreting a different compound entirely, what we call an appeasement compound that ants find really attractive. And they'll actually drink from the back end of this beetle, okay? And what this appeasement compound does, it essentially tricks the ant into accepting the beetle. So eventually, the, beetle will, the ant will feed the beetle trophallactically, mouth to mouth. You can see this globule of stuff being regurgitated from the ant's crop here. And then Lomacusa also has these brush-like structures here, which are those kinds of uh, glands similar to the ones I showed you earlier in the talk in that other beetle species. That they, and they produce a different chemical entirely to the appeasement gland, which is back here. And ants also find the stuff exuded from this part of the abdomen really attractive. They'll start licking this region of the abdomen, and this instructs the ant to pick the beetle up and adopt it inside the nest. So they'll carry the beetle into the colony after feeding on this kind of adoption solution and dump Lomacusa in the brood galleries. And once Lomacusa is in the nest, in the brood galleries, it lays its own eggs, its larvae hatch out, and they produce a compound which instructs the worker ants to feed their larvae preferentially over the ant's own larvae. Right? So it's this amazing chemical Swiss army knife that's been afforded by the reduction in elytra and the elaboration of the glandular chemistry of these beetles' abdomens. So in rope beetles, you have this sort of tangible process by which symbiosis evolves with these two key parameters. There's changes in the chemistry of the beetle from ancestral defensive compounds, you know, these benzoquinone compounds, which they use to chemically defend themselves, to chemistries which are much better able to manipulate ants, essentially pacify ants, and force the, beetle, uh, force the ant to interact socially with the beetle, and changes in the beetle's own behavior from an ancestral fear-like response towards ants, where they chemically defend themselves and run in the opposite direction, to one of true social integration, where the beetle will actually seek out ants and interact often extremely intimately, in, in, in extremely intimate ways with the ants inside colonies. Okay, now this kind of transition from free living to symbiotic is what we're interested in in my lab. And we use rove beetles to study how it happens at a molecular and cellular level. So we're interested in both of these phenomena, studying it in these rove beetles that we uh, uh, culture in the lab. Now, my own association with rove beetles, Steve kind of alluded to it at the beginning of the talk, is also evolutionarily quite ancient. Um, this is me, aged, I think, 10, at the Amateur Entomologist Society field trip uh, in Coventry, uh, peering at some beetles down the, down the microscope. Um, so I've loved insects from very early on. I think I was seven when I started collecting insects in earnest. Um, and when I was 16, I was kind of focused primarily on beetles. And one day, I caught this specific rove beetle species in my sweep net in a swamp on the outskirts of Cardiff. I grew up in, in South Wales, Swansea, not Cardiff, but that's a big difference if you're from South Wales. Um, this beetle here, Rybaxis laminata, and it really caught my eye. It's only 2.3 millimeters long, but the way it walked at the base of my net and the way it kind of glistened in the light, it just seemed so beautiful. And so I became obsessed with rove beetles. And one of the first things you learn about rove beetles is that many of them are these amazing myrmecophiles which live inside ant colonies. Um, and I was sort of obsessed with like, this phenomenon by which something like this could 
evolve into something like this. And Myrmica files are often extremely hard to find. So it seemed like real insect treasure to be able to find these Myrmica files. It was a real challenge for me when I was gr growing up. But I was particularly interested in how kind of mechanistically it was even possible to transform something like this into something like this. And so for my PhD and a large amount of my postdoctoral research, I switched to working on Drosophila developmental genetics to really get some mastery of molecular and genetic tools and approaches in insects, which you know down the line I would like to apply to rove beetles. And this was my long-term strategy. The UK PhD is only three years. And I figured at the beginning of it, you know, by the end of the three years, I'll have found some rove beetle version of Drosophila and I'll have abandoned Drosophila. And it was a means to an end. Anyway, over a decade goes by and you're still stuck in flies, wondering about how you're ever gonna make this, you know, uh, uh, transition back to rove beetles to do what you really want to do. Okay, and so I was sort of dialing it in in my postdoc, studying Drosophila genetics. Um, until one night when I was cruising the internet looking at beetle pictures, which is the kind of thing that I like to do. Uh, and I noticed this, okay. This is a species of rove beetle just cropped up on my screen that I found was being sold commercially by integrated pest management companies in the United States. It's called Delotia coriaria. And you can buy it in these tubs. It contains like thousands of beetles. They're just a few millimeters long. And you can dump them into your greenhouses. I don't know how many of you Californians have a, one of these organic cannabis farms, but this is a really popular species to dump in your greenhouse, and it feeds on things like fungus gnats and thrips, so crop pests. So it's very good at suppressing agricultural pests. And this is why it's kind of taken off as a pest control agent. And I thought to myself, wow, this is really amazing, this rove beetle species that you can you know, grow and commercially sell. I'm sure I could get it in the lab and it maybe it would grow very quickly, much like Drosophila, and have really model organism life history parameters, things like a short generation time, you know, a large number of eggs, things like this that make fruit flies so amenable to genetic experiments. Um, and crucially, in the evolutionary tree, of rove beetles, it sits here, right? So it was the it firmly embedded within this group of organisms that are predisposed to make this evolutionary transition to life inside social insect societies. And to all intents and purposes, Delotia is so predisposed. It's the embodiment of the evolutionary starting conditions. Everything I was interested in towards a symbiotic lifestyle. And so we've transformed in my lab, Delotia coriaria, into a genetic model system with many of the same tools which are, have been available for a long time in Drosophila. So since coming to Caltech, we've sequenced this species genome. Um, it has a 120 megabase genome. It's the smallest genome of any of the uh, beetle species sequenced so far. Actually slightly smaller genome size than Drosophila. And a small genome is a very good thing. That's a manageable amount of DNA. It makes it much easier to kind of figure out what makes this beetle tick than having a much larger genome. Um, and we've been able to develop methods to genetically manipulate Delotia. So we can make, for example, mutations in single genes using CRISPR, which is something you, method you've probably heard about, that's able to kind of edit the base pairs within targeted genes. So this is an example of a CRISPR mutant beetle. Uh, this is the normal beetle here. Um, and you can, uh, this is the larval stage, actually. And you can see it's got these kind of uh, larval appendages, these three legs here. And here, We've mutated a gene called distillus, which is responsible for the development of the distal legs. And you can see you completely delete these structures in the mutant animal. So we can engineer mutations in this beetle now, which is a kind of really essential component of being able to have a genetic model rove beetle. We've also developed methods to introduce exogenous DNA into the genome of this beetle so we can kind of program and visualize the behavior of different cell types within the uh, within the beetle, for example, in its brain or in its gla uh, uh, glandular structure. Um, we do this using these piggyback transposable elements. These are kind of 
circular pieces of DNA and you bombard early embryos and hope that these things kind of integrate somewhere into the genome. And you can tell if that's happened because they're marked with a fluorescent protein, M. cherry, which expresses in the uh, abdominal segment. So you get these glowing red beetles that tell you that you've made a transgenic, genetically modified beetle. We can add different payloads into this um, uh, genetic vector now to start to label uh, and make genetic tools uh, w w within, this, within this beetle. Now, what are we interested in? Well, we're interested in Delotia's brain and the neural circuits that enable it to interact with ants, in particular this defensive behavior where it uses its uh, benzoquinone uh, abdominal gland uh, and to chemically defend itself and flee, right? And we're also interested in the gland itself and its genetic capacity to manufacture different classes of compounds, these benzoquinones and the solvents that they're dissolved in. And we're interested in both of these things really as a foundation to understand how they've each evolved in the many convergent lineages of myrmecophile, which have departed this kind of ancestral ground plan and taken up residence inside social insect societies. So we use the lotia as a kind of starting point to understand how the beetle has been remodeled for symbiosis. But since coming to Caltech, we've started to add other species into our kind of menagerie, including symbiotic species, which are counterpart, myrmecophile counterparts to Delotia, to start to draw these comparisons. Now, the species that we use, we catch locally. We're here, obviously, all tonight down in Caltech, and I firmly believe that when, you know, people were deciding where to build Caltech, they must have had myrmecophiles in mind because it's the perfect ecological setting to be able to study these organisms, both in nature and in the lab, because you can collect them in large numbers all year round from the Angeles National Forest up here. So wherever there's sort of relatively permanent water all year round, wherever there's a nice kind of canyon and a, a creek, you find this species of ant in large numbers. Some of you may have, if you go hiking, you will definitely have seen this ant. It's called the velvety tree ant, can, you, can somebody shout if they've seen this thing? I just want to see if anyone's... All right, okay. This is our ant, Pasadena. <laughs> uh, this is the velvety tree ant. We should adopt this uh, as our, as our uh, city mascot. Um, uh, it's a really impressive ant. It may be the biggest colony-forming ant in the United States. Uh, it forms colonies of millions of workers. Um, they form trails that you know, can reach 100 meters across the forest floor. Um, and it really runs the show in the mountains north of, of, of campus. And it's a really horrible ant, right? If you put your hand in the nest, they really do not like it. And they all start biting you and emitting alarm pheromone. But that's great, because it's always the nasty ants that have the coolest myrmecophiles inside their colonies. <laughs> um, and the velvety tree ant has multiple rove beetles that live inside its nest. Here's one of them that we're interested in. This is Platyusa, uh, a true myrmecophile that lives kind of on the periphery of these uh, 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 velvety tree ant colonies. And it's a kind of myrmecophile version of Delotia, right? But it's able to exist in and around these ant colonies because it's got a trick in its tail. If ants detect it, it gives them a big dose of an appeasement secretion from a novel gland at the tip of the abdomen. Right? So it's constantly appeasing these ants by secreting a compound that pacifies them so the, beetle, the ants are not aggressive towards platy users. It's a true myrmecophile. Just to kind of compare the behavior of uh, Delotia, the free living species, which, you know, spray and run away, as one of my students calls this behavior, uh, using the benzoquinone gland to chemically defend yourself. Um, so platy user, you can see really dramatic difference in behavior. So the beetle's constantly exuding this appeasement stuff from the tip of the abdomen. The ants are always wandering up to it, drinking from the back end of this beetle. We don't know what this stuff is, but it's kind of magical. Um, and you can see the beetle's own behavior has evolved, right? It's perfectly adjusted to these ants. It's not trying to run away from them. The two organisms are completely calm around each other. The beetle shows no fear of the ant. And the ant's basically chemically doped into not attacking the beetle. So it's a really beautiful and harmonious um, relationship. Now, there's a, tr a kind of twist to this, right? Because platy user still has the sort of 
I guess, evolutionarily primitive benzoquinone defense gland that Delotia has. It just never uses it against its host ant. It probably uses it against other ants, right, or other aggressive organisms that it encounters. It just shuts off this behavior around its ant and instead selects this different, much more social behavioral program of using this appeasement gland, which is a novel structure that only Platy user has. And this is extremely interesting because what we think is happening is that, you know, this beetle here, Platy user, has evolved to symbiotically associate with this ant here and is able to smell its host ant. And this is what dictates the behavior that it executes. Okay, if it smells its host ant, it does not use its defense gland. It instead uses this appeasement secretion. And this is really this amazing behavioral reversal from a fear-like response to one of a much more productive social interaction. And probably every lineage of myrmecophile has undergone this evolutionary transition from a fear-like response towards ants to a, an attractive one and some kind of behavioral adaptation to stop the ants attacking the beetle. And this may be a kind of embodiment of social evolution in general, the ability to distinguish a partner that you want to interact with and to select a behavior which is a much more productive way of interacting with that partner. And we're very interested in exploiting this difference between Delotia, the free-living species, and this symbiotic species, Platyusa, or beetles very similar to it, to understand how changes in the brain have mediated this behavioral reversal. So one thing that we're doing in my lab is developing technologies to understand the neurobiology of rove beetles, applying the kinds of tools that are available in fruit flies into these beetles. And these beetles are amazing behavioral subjects for doing this kind of thing. You can tether them to floating ball treadmills like this one here. This is Delotia walking along. And because it's got this amazing kind of flexible uh, um, appendage, this abdomen, even though it's tethered there and it kind of thinks it's like walking through leaf litter or something, it will still interact in the stereotypical way with ants by flexing its abdomen over and blasting the poor ant that we introduce using a linear actuator in the face or on the thorax with benzoquinones, okay? So you can reconstitute this interaction in a really controlled way. And what this means is we can start to deconstruct this interaction and quantify aspects of it using things like machine vision. So this is Delotia here running on this uh, floating ball treadmill again. But now we've used uh, deep learning to track the movement of the body as the beetle runs along this ball, okay? And this program is kind of feeding coordinate information to us so we can actually track individual parts of this beetle as it moves along uh, in this kind of infinite space. And we can track the uh, uh, trajectory and velocity of the beetle as it uh, walks along the, oops, uh, uh, floating ball treadmill using these landmarks um, on the ball. I need to go back a slide and just point out something. Uh, these landmarks, I don't know if you can see them here, are actually my family's names <laughs> written, written onto this ball. My colleague insisted uh, on kind of graffitiing the ball with uh, uh, the name of my wife, Heidi, who's sitting in the audience, uh, and, our, and our children. But those landmarks are extremely useful because it enables us to calculate the velocity and locomotion of the beetle on the ball. Okay. Uh, and so using this kind of setup, we can start to ask what aspects of the kind of sensory system of the beetle are being triggered when it interacts with, with ants and releases the kind, this kind of defensive behavior, this use of the defensive gland. So these are the sorts of experiments we can do. This is a time course of the flexing of the abdomen, the abdominal raise, uh, over four minutes. And it's during minute three that we've presented the ant the dead ant actually to the beetle. We've maneuvered this ant into position. It's actually touching the beetle during this minute. And you can see during this minute, there's a ton of flexing of the abdomen, right, over the top of the beetle as the, as the beetle's repeatedly blasting the ant with its chemical defense gland, right? So we can actually quantify the number of times and the specific uh, angle of motion of the abdomen during this uh, period of stimulus presentation. We can also see how the beetle has been moving as it's been interacting with the ant. This is the kind of thing you see. This is the trajectory of the beetle here during the four minutes. And this, this is the one minute of dead ant presentation. The beetle's actually rooted to the spot and just flexing its abdomen repeatedly, hitting the ant with its chemical defense gland, 
Okay, so this is a kind of stereotype behavior that we can start to ask how the beetle is uh, using its kind of sensory apparatus to perceive this ant as a threatening organism. So we can chemically strip the ant by dipping the ant into hexane. This removes the cuticular hydrocarbons, the body surface volatiles. And you can see now, when you present the dead, chemically stripped ant to the beetle, all of these behaviors fall away. Okay, so you get hardly any flexing of the abdomen. It's kind of an insignificant amount of uh, uh, defensive gland deployment. And the beetle just keeps walking. It doesn't stop, even though the ant's actually physically touching it. Without any chemicals there to detect that it's an ant, it just keeps plodding along on the ball. And so what we're really interested in doing is kind of taking this further to deconstruct the specific chemicals that the beetle is uh, detecting on the ant and the physical cues which, it's being, uh, which are being used to build up a kind of multi-sensory uh, representation in the beetle's brain of what this ant is. And we want to understand how that kind of representation is given uh, a value, whether it's a positive thing, it's something it wants to interact with, or a negative thing, an aversive threatening stimulus in the case of Delotia, because that's the key parameter that's evolved in these myrmecophile species. So to try and get at this in terms of neural architecture and brain circuits controlling these behaviors, we're now rebuilding this system to image the brain in the behaving beetle. And we're not there yet, but I can show you a couple of uh, really kind of tantalizing um, uh, videos and images here. This beetle here has a big hole in its head. We've built a, uh, a head plate for this beetle to be able to image its brain as it's interacting with this ant stimulus. You can see it's still flexing its abdomen. And what we want to do is kind of take this paradigm here and image through this hole using a two photon microscope of a beetle like this, which is expressing genetically encoded calcium sensors that we're building in its brain, which enable us to visualize neural activity as the beetle is interacting with the ant in real time. So we can pick up actual motifs and circuits in the brain of this beetle, which is transducing multi-sensory information from the ant and leading to the execution of this defensive behavior. We want to be able to do this so that we can then replicate the same kind of study in a myrmecophile to understand how changes in the brain have mediated their alternative response to the same ant stimulus. Okay, so that's one of the main things that we're trying to achieve in my lab at the moment. I want to kind of switch gears now and talk about another myrmecophile beetle that you also find in colonies of velvety tree ants that we're also extremely interested in for other reasons. Um, and it's this little guy here, okay? So in amongst the chaos of the velvety tree ant colony, and I highly encourage everyone to like start digging these things up and looking for these beetles, you'll find this little guy walking around completely cool with all of the kind of ant chaos and aggression which is going on around it. It's perfectly adjusted to life inside the colony. You actually find it much deeper in the nest than Platyusa. It's a much more specialized beetle than Platyusa. It's called Skeptobius, right? Which sounds really kind of cheeky scientific name. Skeptobius is awesome, because as soon as you put Skeptobius in a container with an ant, this is what you see. It'll actually climb up on top of the ant, and the ant's completely fine with this. The ant will actually stop moving most of the time. And Skeptobius is kind of doing something really interesting when it's on top of the ant. Uh, we wondered what this thing was, so we started making all sorts of videos to see what Skeptobius is really about, because it seems to be kind of magnetically drawn to the ant. Um, and I hope you can see in this video here what it's doing. It's scraping its feet against the ant and smearing its feet over its own body. I'll let this play for a little while, because uh, this is my student Julian's video, and it's a particularly good one that we all really like. It really shows the behavior of this beetle in really uh, high resolution. Can you see this kind of scraping and grooming behavior, as we call it? Maybe, okay, I'll play another video. Uh, this is slowed down now in infrared, and you can see these are the beetle's legs here. They scrape against the ant and then they smear over its own body, right? This is, I think, extremely clear. I can tell you what Skeptobius is doing. Skeptobius is stealing the cuticular pheromones from the ant and applying them to its own body to chemically disguise itself so it can achieve perfect social integration inside these colonies. It, it 
perfectly chemically mimics the ant to gain the ant's acceptance. And this is such an effective strategy that Skeptobius uh, has evolved. That if you compare the chemical profiles of the beetle in the ant after it's engaged in this behavior, this is what you see. So this is a, a gas chromatograph trace of cuticular hydrocarbons from the ant in black, all these peaks of different compounds. And this is Skeptobius's compounds in blue here. And you can see there's a really good correlation between them. We think Skeptobius has actually lost its capacity to manufacture its own cuticular hydrocarbons and just physically steals them from the ant to cloak itself to live inside the colony. And they can spend hours on top of these ants grooming them, okay? Now, this behavior is really kind of, sometimes you get two or three Skeptobias on the same ant. Sometimes you see them actually mating with each other on top of an ant, which is kind of ridiculous and a little bit gross. Um, <laughs> and, you know, evolving this behavioral and chemical adaptation surely took, you know, a relatively long time. It's extreme specialization on a single host organism, right? You only find Skeptobias in this one uh, ant species colonies. This is a feature of really all symbioses, this host specificity, engaging with a single partner so you can really specialize on that partner, okay? This question of host specificity like, poses many challenges to symbiotic or organisms. They have to be able to kind of keep up with their host. They have to be able to locate it uh, uh, easily and maintain some kind of close association with it, often a, a physical one. And we're very interested in this phenomenon of host specificity, and we can use Skeptobius to study it because we can bring these beetles into the lab and study them there. And you can't do that for many symbiotic interactions because it's almost impossible to reconstitute in the laboratory. Now, Skeptobius is a particularly good one to study host specificity because it exists in the Southwest US as three different species, okay? This is the evolutionary tree of Skeptobius here. This is the evolutionary tree of the host ants here. And you can see a Skeptobius, di uh, as the ants diversified into three species, the beetles diversified with them. They went, underwent co-speciation, okay? Because they're so closely associated with the ants that as the ant populations split and diverged, the beetles kept up with them, right? Now, around here, this is the uh, specific beetle and ant pairing that we have. And we can use this to ask, how has Skeptobius able to recognize and associate with just a single ant species and not any of these other ant species here, even though sometimes you find two ant species at the same site, okay? Now, again, like Delotia and Platyusa, Skeptobius is a, an amazing behavioral subject, and I think all of these beetles are, because if they don't execute these kind of stereotype behaviors with ants, they're as good as dead. You know, you hear about nature shows where someone spends three months trying to film like a bower bird or something like this. As soon as you put Skeptobius or one of these myrmecophiles in an arena with ants, it starts to do these amazing symbiotic behaviors. And so this is Skeptobius here on top of an ant, um, grooming it, and it'll do this, you know, uh, so routinely that you can actually kind of multiplex this and have many of these wells and use machine vision to start tracking this social interaction in kind of relatively high throughput between the beetle and the ant. We want to use this system, and this is what we're starting to do, to address this question of host specificity. Now, you can change the insect which is in the arena with Skeptobius to see if it'll interact with it. And so this is a bug, Hemiptera, like totally not an ant. And you can see Skeptobius is whirring around here, kind of like a washing machine, completely uninterested, <laughs> totally uninterested in the bug, okay? Because the bug is not the ant, right? And so there's something about the bug which isn't an ant, and Skeptobius is not interested. Now, you can track the movement of the, the distance apart of these two insects over time and see that there's, you know, they're really never very close to each other at all because there's no sort of symbiotic affinity of these two organisms. If you exchange um, the bug for Skeptobius' actual host ant, this is what you see. Sure enough, straight away it's up there, it's climbing on top of it. The ant's kind of often slowing down, um, and it'll stay up there for a very large amount of time uh, grooming the ant. Um, and this is the kind of trace that you produce by uh, monitoring the, mo the distance between these two insects over time. Okay, so we have this kind of extreme, bug, no interest, um, host ant, extreme interest, okay? Now, 
it seems to be the case that the chemicals on the body surface of the ant are key to this interaction. This, they kind of trigger Skeptobius into interacting with the ant and doing this grooming behavior. We can show this using this experiment here. If you kill the ant, Skeptobius still climbs up on top of it and starts grooming it, okay? The dead ant's completely fine for Skeptobius. It really does not care. Um, but you can chemically strip the ant. You can remove these cuticular hydrocarbons and Skeptobius shows no interest in the ant, okay? So that tells you that the chemicals are key, and you can actually reapply the chemicals back to the stripped ant and reconstitute the behavioral interaction again. So clearly the body surface chemicals of the ant are triggering this social symbiotic behavioral program of Skeptobius. Now, this is kind of a really clean way to start to address this question of host specificity because we can take this evolutionary tree of uh, host ants and ask things like, what happens when you put in the sister species of Skeptobius' normal host ants? It's five million years separate from Skeptobius. It's chemically dissimilar to, Skept uh, to, to Skeptobius' uh, usual host ant. Surely Skeptobius will be able to tell the difference between this ant and its usual host ant and show no interest in it. That's what we thought. In fact, that's totally not the case. Skeptobius in the lab is extremely promiscuous, right? You can break the kind of host specificity in the laboratory and skep get Skeptobius to groom the wrong ant, right? Now you might say, well, you know, this ant is only five million years divergent from the usual host. Maybe it's chemically very similar. So you can repeat this experiment with ants that are 95 million years separate from the host ant. These two here, this is a formica wood ant that Skeptobius is grooming, and this is a, a, a harvester ant, Veromessel. Skeptobius will also climb on top of it and groom it. It's very chemically divergent from these ants. So this is a kind of a conundrum, and I'm gonna give you my interpretation for what's going on here. And it's kind of addresses, I think, a real problem that symbiotic animals have is that you have to accommodate variation in your host phenotype, you know, the, uh, the um, features of the, the, your host that you're interested in and may trigger you to execute kind of symbiotic behaviors with your host may themselves vary. And this is, I think, what we've tapped into using these experiments. So clearly the ant body pheromones that trigger grooming from Skeptobius uh, are you know, these cuticular hydrocarbons. We can demonstrate that. But Skeptobius in the wild is encountering ants of its host species, which show variation in their cuticular hydrocarbon profiles. Variation come, can come about environmentally or genetically. And so when Skeptobius wanders into an ant colony, it has to recognize its you know, potential suitor as an ant that it wants to groom. And so it has this sort of broad spectrum response and is able to accommodate a substantial amount of cuticular hydrocarbon variation and still recognize the ant as something it wants to groom, okay? And you can kind of push this to the limit in the laboratory by adding in a different ant species. Now, if we look at the cuticular hydrocarbon profiles of something like the 95 million year divergent ant, Veromessel, and the normal host ant, even though they're very different to each other, there are still some compounds here which are shared between them. And the, compound, the chemical trace is also very complex and sort of characteristic of ants. And this, we think, is kind of enough to stimulate Skeptobius to groom the wrong host ant. It won't groom a bug because the bug's chemical trace is really simple and very, very different to an ant's cuticular hydrocarbon profile. So the beetle can kind of detect ant versus non-ant and will groom really anything that is an ant and is sufficiently chemically complex. But why doesn't this happen in the natural world? Why is it that we only ever see these Skeptobius associating with single host ants? Well, we think that host specificity is actually not controlled by chemicals on the ant's body surface. There are additional chemical cues that the beetle is using, we think, that constrain its association to just a single host ant species. And our hypothesis is that these are the trail pheromones, okay? So when we go out into the mountains and we see these ant trails, 
cutting across the forest floor. You can see Skeptobius walking along in them. The ant has laid a chemical trail, and we think the chemicals there are very species-specific, and Skeptobius is plugged into those specific compounds, okay? And that constrains its movement from one colony to another, but only of the same host ant species. Okay, so it's never afforded the opportunity to encounter colonies of the wrong ant species. If it should, then maybe it will actually try its luck and groom that ant, okay? But this, we think, is how host specificity in the system is controlled, by using different sources of information from your host organism, and presumably other examples of symbiosis that we see in the natural world have a similar kind of layered architecture and level of complexity that controls how these organisms interact with each other. So we think that we understand both the kind of mechanisms of chemical mimicry in Skeptobius and also the chemical cues that Skeptobius is using to recognize something that it wants to groom, an ant. And these are one and the same thing. They're these cuticular hydrocarbons. Skeptobius is this brilliant mimic of the ant's cuticular hydrocarbons because it actually steals them from the ant. And it's also using the ant's own cuticular hydrocarbons to, you know, uh, recognize the ant and trigger this grooming behavior. Now, the beetle I showed you earlier, Platyusa, is kind of doing a similar thing. We think it, it executes this appeasement behavior towards the same host ant by smelling that ant, and if it ticks the right kind of chemical boxes, it'll recognize that ant as its host ant, and it'll not use its defense gland. It will instead try and appease that ant. And Platyusa itself is a pretty good chemical mimic of the same host ant, right? It's not perfect. You can see that it's got these additional peaks here, which the ant doesn't have. And the reason for this is, is because Platyusa, we think, manufactures its own cuticular hydrocarbons, right? It makes its own approximation of the ant's chemical trace, right? We, how do we know this? Well, we can measure carbon-13 ratios in these specific cuticular hydrocarbon compounds, which is a very good indicator of their biosynthetic source, whether it's come from the ant or it's come from the beetle, okay? So using this kind of carbon-13 to carbon-12 ratio in these specific uh, cuticular hydrocarbons, we can see that the ant is here, okay, and the beetle is here for these specific for cuticular hydrocarbons, okay? So they're clearly coming from different biosynthetic sources. The beetle is making its own and the ant is making its own, and the beetle's mimicry is kind of imperfect. This is probably why it has this additional appeasement behavior. So if the ant really pays a lot of attention to it, it can detect this chemical difference, and the beetle is forced to adopt this different strategy of appeasing the ant, kind of pacifying it using its uh, chemical uh, uh, appeasement gland. Now, Contrast this to Skeptobius, right? There's really good overlap in really all of these um, uh, carbon-13 to carbon-12 ratios in all of these cuticular hydrocarbons, and that's just because the beetle is stealing these cuticular hydrocarbons from the ant. Okay, so both these beetles smell like ants, and they're both triggered to engage in these social behaviors by the cuticular hydrocarbon profile of the host ant. So, as a kind of ultimate test of this, I don't know if you've kind of put two and two together, but we should ask what happens when we put these two things together? Because they both smell like ants and they're both responding to ants to execute these behaviors. They should start to interact with each other in the same way that they interact with ants, right? If we are correct about this. And this is exactly what we see. Uh, this is Platy user here, uh, trying to appease Skeptobius. And this is Skeptobius trying to mount the back of Platyusa, <laughs> right? So both these beetles are kind of fooling the other one, but also being fooled themselves into thinking that the other beetle is an ant, right? <laughs> and we actually wondered if Ske uh, uh, Platyusa was, uh, Skeptobius was trying to feed on the appeasement secretion of um, Platyusa. And remember I told you, you know, Skeptobius really doesn't care. It'll groom a dead ant, okay? So we kill Platyusa and Skeptobius will groom the dead platyusa, so it, you know, and it actually latches onto the antenna in the same way that it latches on to the ant's antenna, okay? 
So clearly, this is a kind of really beautiful proof of concept experiment that we understand both the chemical mimicry strategies and the, chemi uh, and the host recognition strategies by these myrmecophile beetles, which are both targeting the same ant species. And the kind of final question is, why don't these beetles recognize themselves as ants and start grooming and appeasing themselves? That's an answer I can't give you at the moment. Okay. So I just want to finish by kind of summarizing what we're trying to do here with this ant beetle system. So the basic question that we're asking is how does one species of organism evolve the capacity to interact with another species of organism? Okay, and this is a kind of fundamental feature of social and symbiotic interactions wherever you see it in the animal kingdom. And here we have a kind of novel but highly tractable system to bring it into the laboratory and study it in molecular detail. So by studying these questions in this ant beetle system, we can illuminate a really fundamental feature of the natural world, which is how organisms interact with each other. Okay, and I'd like to thank you for listening and also thank the members of my lab, which have you know, produced all of this work since I've arrived at Caltech. Um, I'd like to thank Mina, uh, David, and Sheila and their development of genetic tools and genomic resources for Delotia, our kind of laboratory model system rove beetle. Um, Han, who's uh, pioneering the neurobiology of these beetles. Um, Adrian and Eureka, who study the um, glandular biosynthesis mechanisms in these beetles, which is something I really like, I didn't just didn't have time to talk to you about tonight, but it's just as fascinating how these beetles have these kind of contraptions in their abdomen that are able to manufacture and synthesize these like, amazing compounds. Um, Tom and Julian, who are, I guess, team Skeptobius. Uh, you can often find them on some uh, mountainside uh, north of campus. If you hear some rustling in the bushes, it may be a bear, actually, so don't, you know, don't mess with that. But it could also be these guys digging inside velvety tree ant colonies uh, looking for myrmecophiles. Um, uh, John, who's our ant keeper, who looks after our colonies of velvety tree ants in the lab. Um, and, and some of the collaborators which have been involved in this work, Michael Dickinson, our neighboring lab. Um, Alex Sessions, who's helped us with the kind of chemical analyses. And Fan Gao, who's helped us with uh, genome assembly. Um, and people who've started to fund this work uh, over the past couple of years. Thank you very much. <laughs>